It's five in the evening on May 13, 1981. In St. Peter's Square, a Turkish terrorist named Ali Agca prepares to shoot the Pope. During one of the Pope's public audiences, the Turkish terrorist takes advantage of his opportunity. He is just a few yards away from the pontiff when he starts shooting. One of the bullets hits the Pope's stomach, grazing several vital organs. After hours of painful waiting, and despite the gravity of his wounds and the high levels of blood loss, John Paul II pushes through. He is 60 years old at the time. The day of the assassination attempt is also the Feast of Our Lady of Fatima, which commemorates the apparitions of the Blessed Mother to three shepherd children in Portugal. The Pope attributes his survival to the intercession of Our Lady. It is one of the most extraordinary events of his life. And there are many astounding moments associated with him after his death. Among them are two miraculous healings with no scientific explanation. They pave the way for his canonization as the Catholic Church requires two miracles in order to officially declare someone a saint. Those familiar with Parkinson's, one of the most widespread degenerative diseases, know there is still no cure for it. French nun Marie Simone Pierre was well aware of this fact in 2005. At only 46 years of age, she could barely stand on her own two feet. I couldn't watch John Paul II on TV anymore. In his final years, John Paul II was very sick, very tired, and I couldn't bring myself to look at him anymore. He was the image of what I was going to become, and personally, I refused to one day be in a wheelchair. Far from there, in Costa Rica, a mother faces her final days of life. Doctors give her a clear diagnosis, explaining it bluntly to her and her husband. We're letting your wife go. Take her home. Enjoy your last few days of life with your children. I can't tell you exactly how much time, one week, two weeks, but she won't survive this longer than a month. She could die at any moment. It's been nine years since that terrible announcement, and Flory Beth can't stop thanking God and St. John Paul II for not letting the prognosis become a reality. As for Sister Marie, she returns to work at the clinic she had left because of Parkinson's. John Paul II is still alive. This plaque in St. Peter's Square marks the exact spot, a few yards away from Bernini's colonnade, where Pope John Paul II is shot. The terrorist, Ali Agja, is a professional assassin, experienced in this type of crime. He shoots his objective from a few yards away with a 9mm Browning pistol. He never understood how the Pope survived such an attack. With the damage in his stomach caused by one of the bullets, and as he is losing a great deal of blood, the Pope is transported by an ambulance to the emergency room in this hospital, Policlinico Gemelli. John Paul II remains conscious throughout the drive. He takes advantage of the opportunity to entrust his soul to the will of God. His blood pressure continues to drop with each passing minute, while medical responders prepare for a life or death operation. Inside the operating room, Surgeons extract three liters of blood to locate the source of the hemorrhage. The colon is perforated, and the small intestine has five different wounds. Even today, the shirt worn that day by the Pope is preserved in one of the churches in Rome. It was kept by one of the nurses and still has the blood stains from that day. Meanwhile, St. Peter's Square is blocked off. No one can leave until the situation is clarified and Ali Agja is arrested. The majority of those present begin to pray for the pontiff, who undergoes a five-hour surgery. Antonio Palayo, a Spanish journalist, experienced those moments firsthand. It was a miracle, really it was. First of all, by a matter of millimeters, the bullet did not perforate the artery. If that had happened, he would have died on the spot. 
Then there was a second miracle, which was the decision to transfer him to Gemelli Hospital so quickly. Before this event, no other pope of the modern popes had left the Vatican, not even for medical care. Thanks to this decisive action, they were able to save him in Gemelli. He had already lost a lot of blood, and he was in a state of unconsciousness. Little by little, the news arriving from the hospital offers reassurance. The chaos, however, and the sense of anguish in Rome are evident. There was a huge commotion because never before had there been an assassination attempt of that nature. Moreover, in that moment, the most absurd theories were circulating. There were also theories that weren't so absurd. It is a mystery that remains to be clarified. I remember the atmosphere. I remember there was a huge commotion among the people. They were following the news about the Pope's health, on how he was responding to treatment. There were still evening newspapers, so you could see people buying the paper and telling others, well, it looks like he's doing better. It looks like they're going to save him. It looks like he's not going to die. There was a huge commotion. It is the Pope's secretary, Monsignor Stanislaw Jivich, who tells the Pope of the coinciding date of the assassination attempt with the Fatima apparitions. Slavomir Oder, the postulator of the cause, responsible for collecting evidence for John Paul II's canonization, analyzes the documents recounting those dramatic hours. They reveal the Pope's firm belief in the divine intervention that took place. Indeed, he considered that event to be a miraculous event. He himself said, one man shot. Another hand, the hand of Our Lady, guided that bullet in a way that practically saved all the vital organs in his body. As a matter of fact, the doctors who treated him at the time remain astounded because the bullet, while passing through his body, grazed the vital organs without damaging them. It is inexplicable. It is scientifically inexplicable. Surely, there is the conviction that the Mother of God was the one who protected him in that moment. Pope John Paul II's life, from that moment, takes on a special meaning. The postulator of his cause, who collects the information necessary to declare him a saint, affirms that Carol Wojtyla always considered his life a gift as something unmerited. As a young man, he survives being hit by a lorry, as well as Nazi and communist persecution, which kills many of his friends. On this occasion, everything seems even clearer. In the moment of the attempt, this knowledge, in my opinion, becomes even stronger than the gift received, the gift of life, which no longer belongs to him. If up until the moment of the attempt, he gave his life as payment for the debt of love he felt he owed, then after the attempt, he had the awareness that his life no longer belonged to him. It was a gratuitous gift that he had received for the second time.
The fact that he is allowed to keep his life reinforces the purpose of his mission. In thanksgiving for the protection of Our Lady of Fatima, he makes an important decision. From that event on, surely John Paul II grew in his awareness of the significance of the moment. So crucial for the story of humanity. From there then came his decision to consecrate the entire world to the heart of Mary. He does it consciously. He doesn't guide the first moment of consecration. However, he later repeats it with the knowledge that he is doing something pleasing to Our Lady. Abbraccia con amore di madre e di serva del Signore questo nostro mondo umano che ti affidiamo e consacriamo pieni di inquietudine per la sorte terrena ed eterna degli uomini e dei popoli. As a reminder of this protection, the Pope gifts to the Sanctuary of Fatima in Portugal one of the bullets that are shot that day. Since then, they are kept here in the crown of the image. The terrorist who shot the Pope serves his sentence for the crime in this prison in Rome, where an extraordinary scene plays out. The Pope chooses to come all the way here to forgive the man who tried to kill him. Ali Agja never understood how he possibly survived the assassination attempt. Agja had completed his mission.